In an earlier video, I pointed out that the time between after the reflected shock has passed and we've reached state 5 conditions until the time that pressure increases again uh, due to ignition is called an ignition delay time. I didn't mention that there are several other ways that we can determine uh, ignition delay time and some of those are necessary because using the pressure trace is not always as ideal as this plot shows. I also didn't mention why it is we would want to know ignition delay time. A shock tube isn't really a practical combustion device like an internal combustion engine, a jet engine, a scramjet, a rocket engine, or anything else. It's just a research tool. So why do we really care how long it takes our fuel and oxidizer to ignite in a shock tube? Well, it turns out the short answer is that ignition delay time is used as a validation parameter for chemistry models that are then plugged into CFD models. So let's see how that works. So a chemistry model, a more specific name for a chemistry model is a kinetics mechanism. And you can think of a kinetics mechanism as basically a big long text file uh, with the number of species and reactions loaded into it. And then the reactions also have rate parameters that describe the reaction's rate dependency on things like temperature and pressure. We validate kinetic mechanisms by using them to predict fundamental flame properties. The three most common validation metrics for a kinetic mechanism are the ignition delay time, the laminar flame speed, and the extinction strain rate. If the mechanism is able to correctly predict all three of these then we plug it into a CFD code and then use the CFD code to predict more complicated but practical systems such as scramjets, piston engines, jet engines and so forth. I'm not going to talk at all about uh, what laminar flame speed or extinction strain rate is I'm only going to focus on the ignition delay time which is usually uh, referred to as IDT or tau uh, ignition. I've already mentioned one way to determine the ignition delay time which is the pressure. Uh, the other, there are at least four other ways that I'm aware of to determine ignition delay time including watching fuel concentration as a function of time, uh, watching the hydroxyl radical or OH star via chemiluminescence and chemiluminescence is just a fancy term for chemical luminescence. It's basically a chemical giving off light. You can also look at hydrocarbon radical chemiluminescence and also you can just point a camera at uh, the flame and directly visualize ignition uh, happening. So let's try to visualize conceptually why each one of those things can be used to determine ignition. If you have a fixed volume and you've got a bunch of hydrocarbon and oxidizer molecules bouncing around and a hydrocarbon molecule uh, collides with an oxygen and reacts and begins a flame. You can see that some of the hydrocarbon molecules have been consumed and if it continues propagating then you'll see more and more fuel consumption until all of the fuel has been consumed. So oxidation leads to fuel consumption and so obviously if this thing has begun reacting you're going to start seeing uh, fuel go away. In addition, as this reaction occurs, that flame is giving off heat, and that heat ca uh, release causes a pressure increase. And that's why we can see ignition via pressure increase. In addition, we all know flames give off light, but flames also give off very specific types of light. It turns out that that hydroxyl radical is one of the very first things that is created uh, as the fuel begins to decompose, and it emits light at a very specific wavelength, 308 nanometers. Hydroca uh, hydrocarbon radicals are, off are also produced pretty quickly uh, upon ignition, and those give off a, a specific wavelength of light 430 nanometers and then also there's a wide uh, amount of light in the visible spectrum that we can see with our own eyes or with any camera. So if we go back to the pressure trace that I showed earlier and we add, add a right hand side axis just a normalized signal axis we're gonna use this 
to look at the histories of temperature OH and CH. Uh, and so each of those signals just comes in as a voltage to our data acquisition system. And so we can normalize that signal uh, by its highest quantity. And so all of these will have um, a signal anywhere from 0 to 1. So if we look at fuel concentration first, uh, we can see that fuel concentration starts out at its highest point, and then upon ignition, the fuel begins to be um, consumed until it goes down to 0. Hydrocarbon radicals, on the other hand, start out at zero. There aren't any radical species before uh, ignition begins. And then upon ignition, a lot of radicals are created. But the nature of a radical is that uh, a radical is defined as a highly reactive species. So they're not stable. They want to react into other things. So quickly after radicals are created, they begin to become destroyed and eventually uh, go back down to about zero because just our products are coming out the end. And an OH radical follows a similar path, except that the OH signal is usually a little bit weaker than the CH signal, as a general rule. Now, these are all just nominal theoretical profiles. Let's actually take a look at some actual experimental data from the literature. This particular plot comes from the Hansen group at Stanford, and this pressure profile is the one that I've been showing over and over and over again. And you can see that they listed their mixture of hydrogen, oxygen, and argon. Uh, their T5 is 1124 Kelvin, and their P5 is 3.1 atmospheres, which matches with our y-axis here. So we're familiar with the pressure profile, and then this is an experimental OH profile. Our T0 comes from from the maximum point of pressure rise in the pressure trace here at the reflected shock and then it goes to a line drawn backwards from the point of maximum slope in the OH trace. This picture here is my own drawing of approximately what the experimental setup would be like to get these two profiles. Your pressure transducer is down here on the bottom and then chemiluminescence is a single ended measurement. In other words, um, the light source is the flame itself, and so the flame just uh, sends light out through an optical port. We use a lens typically to focus the light onto a photo detector, and then we need to have uh, typically a bandpass filter centered at 308 nanometers that filters out any light that's not coming from OH. CH is a similar situation. Here again, uh, we, we have our pressure trace, and then the red line is a CH chemiluminescence. And you can see that it's a very um, narrow profile there of CH. And so again, we're using uh, the reflected shock as time zero, and then ignition time is from there to the maximum point of uh, rise of CH. And this experimental setup is going to look almost identical, except that we switch out our uh, 308 nanometer bandpass filter with a 430 nanometer bandpass filter. Moving on to fuel concentration, you can see that uh, in this case, uh, the authors were using methane. And we can see that uh, methane starts out at about its normalized uh, original concentration and then eventually uh, as ignition happens that methane concentration goes down to zero and you can compare that with the CH uh, profile that is going up at the same time methane is going down. Now methane concentration is what we call an absorption spectroscopy setup. So in other words you have to shoot a laser beam through the test section and that laser beam is at a specific wavelength that we know methane absorbs at and so a little bit less light comes out the other side and by comparing the amount of light coming out this side to the amount of light that went in this side we can determine methane concentration so we call that an absorption spectroscopy setup notice that they also have listed here an image sequence and it looks like they took one two three four five six images so let's look at what those might have been. So what they would have had there is a camera looking through an optical end wall, and then they just take images, 
every about 20 microseconds it looks like, maybe every 15 microseconds, and slowly you see a flame begin to uh, generate. One thing that's interesting about this visual method is that the camera is pointing through the end wall. All of our other methods we're using sidewall measurements. And that measurement location does actually matter. The end wall is about where this line is here. And so we're taking our measurements, our sidewall measurements, a couple centimeters typically away from that end wall. And so the sidewall, uh, or excuse me, the gas uh, here a couple millimeter, uh, a couple centimeters away from the end wall experiences those T5 conditions, T5 and P5 conditions, for a little bit different time period than at the end wall. So where you measure ignition delay can change the answer a little bit. Here are my references. I hope this was useful.